want to acknowledge uh, an individual first. Uh, Dr. Owens is able to be with us today, so welcome, Dr. Owens. We are grateful that you are here and able to worship with us. Are there any other charter members who are here uh, at the service? Several. Would you please welcome them and bless the charter members? We're grateful for who they are. Uh, Dr. Matthews needs no long introduction, so I'm not going to give one other than to say. What a joy to follow two men whom you so deeply respected and whom I have learned more from about pastoral ministry than any other individuals. God has deeply marked me as he has marked the church through the ministry of M.O. Owens and through the ministry of Ned Matthews. So it is with joy I pray for him and we receive him today as he comes to preach the word. Let's pray. Well, God, we are grateful that we can come and celebrate this day and that we can do it as family and that we could do it today with our pastors here with us. We pray now for Dr. Matthews as he comes that you will empower his body, his mind, and his spirit, that he would do what he has done hundreds, even thousands of times, to preach the word. Give power, we pray, in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. What a joy it is to be with you today. Shelby wanted to be here so much, but um, she's got uh, heart problems. And I want you to, I know if you don't know about this already, I want you to know now that we appreciate your prayers. Those of you who have already been praying and those of you who will continue to pray for her uh, tomorrow, she's going to have the clappers on her heart uh, chest to try to get the heart back in rhythm. Anyway, she loves you. Wish she could be with you. I'll bring you greetings from her. Then also I have part of my family here. They are brought one of my three great granddaughters. One of them is named L. And then my grandsons, Melinda and her husband Ron, so glad to have them here. So many friends. Last night was a great, great time. Be able to fellowship with many of you last night. We've looked forward so much to being with you. And I know my time is limited. I just want to take another moment or two and thank Jeff. Uh, Jeff has been such a great stalwart of the faith, done a great job here. And I know you know that. And so I just praise the Lord for each of you. And I hope we have a little time after the message today to fellowship some more. But I don't want to disappoint you guys, folks. You're going to have to hear. We will be hearing three sermons today on the same text. And uh, I don't want to shortchange it. But my sermon only has two points. My question is this. Do you have a testimony? And the two things, the two points. Is it personal? And can you describe it? Because that's all you need. It must be personal, and it must be described. So, here we go. One afternoon, I was walking in our neighborhood, and a woman driving slowly toward me stopped her car, rolled down the window, and asked directions for a street in the neighborhood. I gave her directions, and then I said, I have a question for you before you go. Would you like to know the way to heaven? I can give you directions for that also, I said. She replied, well, you must understand that I'm not a religious person. I, I, I'm, not, I'm a spiritual person. I knew what she meant. I didn't want her to belabor that. Witches are spiritual persons. I, I'm not a religious person. I, I'm not a spiritual person. Then she quickly rolled up her window and drove away. I'd said nothing to her 
about religion. I'm not going to say anything to you about religion. Religion will not get you to heaven. It might even take you to hell. I'm not saying anything about religion. Or spirituality. Oh, boy, that is a wide, broad subject. I came today to talk to you about a testimony, and whether you have one or not. David had a testimony, and he was eager to tell it. Just two things about his testimony. He said, the Lord is my shepherd, that's personal, and then he described it, the remainder of the text. It was all about his having a personal relationship with the Lord. And so the first requirement for that is the essential part, most essential, personal. It's a personal testimony. We cannot use someone else's personal testimony. It has to be yours. Your wife may be the greatest saint ever since God made saints, but husband, it won't work for you. You can't get to heaven on the coattail of her personal testimony. Same for the wives with the husband. Parents for children or children for parents or great-grandchildren. It's got to be personal. Must be personal. The Lord is my shepherd. Well, he's my shepherd too, you might say. Well, that's fine, but he's also my shepherd. We don't want to get into a contest about this. The Lord is my shepherd shepherd. David's testimony was personal. Jesus was and remains, he said, for him, we know now. It was Jesus was in mind, though he did not know him yet. He was, after all, people said about Jesus, the son of David. Jesus was and remains the shepherd David talked about. He said in John chapter 10, verse 14, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and I am known of mine. It sounds like personal to me. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Testimony is personal. You might ask, well, pre preacher, why are you belaboring the obvious? Well, I don't think it's so obvious. Obviously not. Well, we have our favorite psalm. Psalm 23, I remember when I was at the point of death, the literal point of death, Elisa was with me, sitting with me. I said, well, Elisa, she was, she was lamenting the fact that I might be going home quickly. And I said, Lisa, this is a Psalm 23 moment. All of us will come to the point of death. And if you know the Lord, you'll be so glad you know him personally. This is a Psalm 23 moment when we get near death. It also became, this whole idea of a personal testimony became very vivid to me when I was on a journey with my friends to Rome, one of the destinations of our Holy Land trip. At one of our meals in a hotel restaurant, one of our fellow travelers asked our waiter if he was a Christian. That question very much offended him. Lifting up his chest in pride, he replied, Of course I'm a Christian. All Romans are Christians. Remember, this is the home of the Roman Catholic Church. All Romans are Christians. However, there was nothing personal about his very, very inadequate testimony. Let me repeat, very, very inadequate testimony. Couldn't be any more inadequate than it was. For one, he said, all you had to do was be born in the right place. What about us? Most of us were born in the Bible belt of this nation. That won't get us to heaven. Being born in a Christian home won't get you to heaven if you yourself do not also come to know the same Christ, your mother and dad, your brothers or sisters. No, it has to be personal. Just imagine the Apostle Paul. Well, actually, at that point, he, 
Might have been, but not again. But when he became fully a follower of Christ, the apostle Paul, because he was born in Antioch, did not make him a Christian. There, the Christians were first called Christians in Antioch. But none of that rubbed off on Saul of Tarsus, who later became Paul. No way. It's like saying, if I spend the night in the garage, I'll wake up in the morning as an automobile. Or I experience baptism by water, and that's all the proof I need that I'm saved. Well, you went down a dry, lost person and came up a wet, lost person. As much as I believe, and you do, in personal, the personal commitment of baptism, salvation, professed by baptism, of believer's baptism, it can just be a religious ceremony and nothing more. It doesn't necessarily have to be personal. You say, well, you know, I believe I have a personal relationship with Christ if I'm emotional. You can be as emotional as you want to be. It doesn't matter. You don't need emotion to be saved. But if you have it, that's great. Enjoy it. It won't do you any good other than that. Have fun with your emotion. For example, Saul of Tarsus did not know God, though he was as religious as it gets. I can't imagine anybody more religious than a Pharisee. And a Pharisee of the Pharisees, he said, I am. That's no testimony. A rabbi, but he didn't have a testimony. We must have a testimony. When he personally encountered Christ on the road to Damascus, then he had a testimony. And he told it everywhere he went. It's recorded in Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 22. He loved to tell it. By the way, if you have a testimony of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you can't help it. You just love to tell others every opportunity you get. Somebody said it's fun being a Christian, but we go down with sour faces. Who's going to believe us? <laughs> to encounter with Christ changes you from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet. From the outside to the inside and the inside to the outside. You cannot be the same once you're saved. Never. It takes you through the rest of your life and prepares you to die in faith. And, of course, looking around here, <laughs> that ain't too far for some of us, including myself. A testimony must be personal. Husbands, your wife, sir, testimony won't work for you. Wives, your husbands won't work for you. Not only must it be personal, it must be described. Look at the text with me, Psalm 23. And you'll notice verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd. That's the personal part my shepherd. Everything else is describing what that means. By the way, I would like now for you to stand with me for the reading of the Word of God. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me Beside the still waters, he restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Thank you. Would you be seated? Now, it must be described. This is the the major part of the message. 17 times. Look at your text if you have it open before you. The personal pronoun for me or I is used. 17 times. 
in his describing what it means to have a testimony. My shepherd. I have three great-grandchildren. There's one of them right there. She's going to be a, a writer when she gets older. Precious L. One of my great-grandchildren, when I was visiting with them, her dad, her father walked in the room and she cried out, my daddy. Don't you know our heavenly father loves to hear you say, my father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. 17 times the personal pronoun. 17 times. you get the idea? It's personal. The testimony is personal. We need the Lord as our shepherd. David tells us that the Lord did things for him that he simply could not do for himself. I'm a walking testimony of that. In fact, the Lord had supplied the deficiencies of his life over and over again. There are many things we simply cannot provide for ourselves. And believe me, and I know you know this, those of us who are older, <laughs> a lot more we cannot do for ourselves as we get older. For example, sheep cannot secure pasture for their nourishment. You know that, don't you? If it were up to sheep, they'd all starve to death. Sheep don't provide their own nourishment. If the shepherd doesn't provide it, they don't get it. You say, well, no, sheep, they wander around until they find something. It's not the way sheep or operate. They, they're pretty dumb animals, let's face it. I mean, that's not a good analogy for us to be sheep. If you want to be, it's, they're just about, they're dumb. They don't. You say, well, they're smart enough to go get their own food. They're not. They have to be totally taken care of. To be a shepherd was considered one of the lower jobs among the culture because it required so much of the shepherd. A shepherd had to do so much just to keep his sheep alive. He had to spend the night with them. He had got no vacations. He had to defend them from predators, sometime at the risk of his own life. Sheep are just plain up. So they don't go sheep looking for any nourishment. The shepherd's got to provide it. And how do you know they've got a good shepherd? Well, if you see sheep lying in a brown field, that's a very poor shepherd. But if you see sheep lying in a very green field, Good shepherd. Jesus said, John chapter 10, verse 20, I am the good shepherd. There are bad shepherds. Some pastors are not good pastors. That word pastor means shepherd. You all knew that. They're not good shepherds, pastors, because they don't care enough for the sheep. You got to care for the sheep. You got to care. And they know when they're cared for and not. We're not as dumb as sheep. <laughs> we know we're well cared for by our, our pastor. Say, what's up? Put a big load on a pastor. Yeah, it is. It really is. But his testimony is not about me, and I'm not looking for sympathy. Let's move on. Notice it says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. Let's look at the second description. He says, he leads me beside the still waters. In other words, we shall not only lack, not lack it, by the word, want and lack are the same thing. We shall not lack substance. We shall not lack peace. He leads me beside the still waters. Waters of quietness. You say, well, how do you know those are still waters? Well, you know, the Bible itself, the Bible is the word of God. From cover to cover, including the maps. It's God's word. He has, he's the author. So the preparation for understanding some of this is found in Ezekiel 34. By the way, if you will turn your Bibles to Ezekiel 34. Ezekiel 34 is the chapter in the Old Testament about shepherds, good and bad. God is saying to his leaders, you're bad shepherds, and I am the good shepherd. Jesus later said, I'm the good shepherd. But here in the 34th chapter is where we are here of, of, uh, of Ezekiel, verse 11. For thus says the Lord God, indeed I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his own flock on the days among his scattered sheep. Then look down that chapter to about verse, uh, let's see where we are here, 18, the latter part's a long verse, where it says, uh, it's, it's, is it too little for you to have eaten up, so forth? Then he says, and to have drunk of the clear waters that you must 
defile the residue with your feet. That's what still waters means here. You, you interpret Scripture by Scripture. That's what it means here in the 23rd Psalm. He leads me beside still waters. He means there's no other animals going into that, into that pond or whatever it was, or the still water, quiet, calm waters. No other animals stirring around, swashing all over the place, causing mud to get into it. So the sheep have to drink muddy water. Who wants that? So what does that mean? It means peace. It means peace. He leads me beside the still waters. The Lord gives us peace. And oh my, how we need that. Even in our country right now, I've never seen such turmoil. We seem to have some of the precursors of a possible civil war in this nation. The hatred between the two groups is growing. This is not good for our children. It's even worse for our grandchildren. If things don't change, they're going to encounter opposition and even persecution. You know, just put it down. Because you see, here's what's the problem with our leaders. They don't know human nature. Listen to this. They don't know human nature because they don't know the Bible. If they knew the Bible, they would know that man by nature is wicked. If they knew the Bible. Karl Marx could never have written his manifesto if he'd understood human nature. Communism. Classless society. Ridiculous. People aren't going to do that. Because by nature, we're sinful, and that's why we need a Savior. It's not just a personal, spiritual, religious thing. It's essential to survival as a people. That is why this nation cannot survive unless God's people get serious about prayer enough to pray for a spiritual awakening in America. Because if we ever needed it, we need it now. Amen? He leads me beside the still waters. The third description, I shall not lack healing. That's what that means. The word soul means life. If if you say uh, there's a living soul, that's redundant. The word soul means living. You're saying he's living, living. The word soul means life. What does he mean then? He restores my life. The older you live, the more opportunity You're giving the Lord from the store your life, restore your life. For example, I have personally had my life restored, and I bear testimony to you now. I had a very large aneurysm on my aorta. That is not normally where you have an aneurysm, up in this area right here. It took a lot of x-rays for them to even discover it, but they finally figured it out. You've got a very large aneurysm. The the surgeon woke me up at 2 a.m. in the morning and said, Mr. Matthews, I have to tell you, you have a very large aneurysm, and we're going to have to go into surgery right away to repair it. Well, they did. They did the surgery. Many do not even survive that. I obviously did. But the graft placed on the aneurysm cut a hole in my esophagus. I don't want to get too technical with this. Well, if you have a hole in your esophagus, you have, ger- you have germs, bacteria, bad ones pouring all into your, your body. So I went into surgery, and the, the doctor, the surgeon, put a stent on my aorta to keep that from bursting, and another stent on my hole in my esophagus. Later, I went back for the routine checkup, the x rays. And sitting down with the doctor, my surgeon, he said, well, Mr. Matthews, you have um, an unusual problem. The stent that I put on your hole in your esophagus fell off into your stomach. And this is what he said next. He said, I want you in here tomorrow. We're going to do a procedure on you. And I thought to myself, a procedure? That must mean a surgery, another one, a procedure. I thought, what is that? I've never heard of anything. That fell off into my stomach. Yes, Okay. So the next day I had what he called a procedure. And my surgeon went down in there to get the stent that had fallen off my, I don't hope you don't mind all this medical technical, off the hole in my esophagus into my stomach to put it back on my hole in my esophagus, on my esophagus. Problem. The hole was gone. That doesn't happen, folks. A hole was gone. He didn't believe it. 
He kept looking and looking. He said, we've we got to keep you overnight. I've got to do some more tests. I don't believe this. Did some more tests the next day. You don't have a hole in your esophagus anymore. Listen, I'm a walking miracle. I'm telling you. You say, do you believe in miracles? Well, I ought to. I've just had one. There are a lot of miracles taking place. People just don't realize this. Uh, well, if you ever get in the mood for a miracle, I'm going to tell you, it's wonderful. The, 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 the doctor, for, this is Rex Hospital in uh, Raleigh. The emergency room doctor came up to the room. I had not seen him before. He walked over and he, I'm lying in the bed and he puts his hand on my thigh and begins to rub it. I said, what are you doing? He said, I just want to rub some of your luck off on me. I said, sir, that's not luck. That's God. I mean, if you're lacking a testimony, they'll give you one. I mean, I don't suggest you go. To the, I have a stool here because I did not know, and still don't, well, I'll be able to stand for the entire sermon. But there you go. A lot of weakness and all of that. But this was for me a Psalm 23 moment. He restores my life. Number four, I shall not lack guidance. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Listen to that carefully, for his name's sake. Now, if you're not saved, you have no testimony, that's not, this is not necessarily going to be applicable to you. But if you're saved, if you've been born again, if you know the Lord as your personal Lord and Savior, you've got to remember something. If you sin, publicly or privately, you're messing up the Lord's direction in your life. You see, the sheep, if they were not led in right paths, that would not reflect on the sheep because they were dumb as anyways, as I already said. That would reflect on the shepherd. He's not doing his work. So he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. This is the guidance we all need because the reputation of the Lord is at stake. You think about some of these famous evangelists. They draw these huge crowds and, and all that sort of thing. For example, one of them said that God was telling him, him that he needed to tell his people he needed a $64 million jet plane to go around to his, make his calls on the other. <laughs> it makes you laugh, doesn't it? <laughs> if he had said to his people, let me ask your help. There's a lot of hungry people and people in trouble down there in North Carolina and South Carolina because of a storm then God was in that for sure. Just check Matthew 25 when you get an opportunity. So, if is the Lord's reputation to keep us on the right paths, it's a cooperative fellowship between the saved, former sinner, saved by grace, and the holy God who gave him or her salvation. It's a cooperative effort. We work together. He leads us in the right paths of righteousness for his name's sake. You say, well, I'm a Christian, but I tell you, I have sin in my life. Some of it, just like before I was saved, that'll happen too. Until you understand this, no one ever committed a sin that didn't start here, here, here in the mind. It starts in the mind and then goes into the hands of the feet to do whatever evil is going to be done. Understand that. So that secret is this by famous uh, evangelists in another time, John Christensen. The difference is you must have wholesome thinking. Hear this now. You must have wholesome thinking here to do righteous, holy things with these hands and feet. If you don't do that, sin will always have the dominion over you, even though you know the Lord. Wholesome thinking, holy living. His name's sake. This is no joke, and this is nothing about it that should be taken lightly. God's stake as a shepherd, the good shepherd, is at stake. If we don't understand, he leads us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. It's not just a reflection on you as a Christian when you fall in sin. It's a reflection on him. We are instricably linked, sinner, saint, and the holy God. I know you're a Baptist, but can I get an amen on that? <laughs> Say this with me. This, now, I'm not Pentecostal. Say it with me. Whole, say it. Wholesome thinking 
leads to holy living. You got an A. That's great. Let's move on. I shall not lack security. That's the fifth one. I'll fear no evil, verse 4. The comfort of the shepherd's rod and staff. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Isn't that great? Though I walk through the valley, I have walked through the valley. Been there. In a figurative spiritual way, I began to hear. You see the rod and the staff. The shepherd's rod, this is all, that's right. The shepherd's rod is like a club. And when predators come against the sheep, he beats the predators with a club. The shepherd's staff is for walking. And imagine this situation. I am going through the valley of the shadow of death. I cannot see. It's dark. I know there are predators. I know there are wild animals in here. But I, and I can't even see the shepherd because it's so dark. But I can hear his rod. I can hear his rod hitting the pavement. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. When you get to the point of death, even as I have, it's a great comfort to know the shepherd's with you, isn't it? I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I am with you always to the end of your life. I didn't preach this kind of sermon when I was 25. I thought I'd live forever. 84 is another story. I shall not lack security. I will fear no evil. And the sixth and last one. I shall not lack celebration. Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Now, I can't prove this. Obviously, I can't talk to David, but I think you'd probably agree with me. Goodness and mercy are the names of the sheepdogs. One's named, one's named goodness and the other one's named mercy. Aren't you glad to have goodness and mercy nipping at your heels if there's a predator around? Also, the sheepdogs would keep the sheep in line as they moved along. If you get, if you get out of line, the sheepdog will come up and nip your heels. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Mercy. What is mercy? It's taken from the Hebrew word that also is translated steadfast love. Aren't you glad to hear that word steadfast? You can say, I love you, but then you know, may observe somebody saying I love you, but they don't do it all the time. That's a downer. <laughs> but you just, you, just, you, just, you just can't get over steadfast love. You just can't get over it. The Lord knows us. He knows our hearts. He knows our minds. He knows we're weak. He knows that sometimes we yield to temptation, but he still loves us. John says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, but he never leaves us. Sheepdogs, mercy, goodness, shall follow me. How long? All the days of my life. Is that not comforting? If that's not comforting you, I don't think you can be comforted. That's about as good as it gets. Amen? Oh, this is, this is a tremendous song. So I ask again, do you have a testimony? Are you using someone else's? It must be yours. Is there evidence that, you're, is there evidence that you know the Lord? Do people know you know the Lord because they see him all over you? They know you love the Lord. It's obvious. I wonder if anyone has a testimony if Christ is not obviously at work in one's life. Has Christ truly changed your life? I'm going to give you an opportunity in a moment. I'm going to ask Brother Pastor Jeff just to stand down here in a moment. And I I want you to use this opportunity. We're shortly going to have it. Where you can come, as we as Baptists are good at this, and rededicate yourself to the Lord. As many as you want to do that, that's always a good thing. Just say, a new start for me. I did not know these things that David is talking about, but I want to apply them in my life. I want to give you an opportunity to do that in just a moment. I just want to close by saying, have you truly let the old self in you die that you might have a new life? 
Are you here today and you don't even know for sure you know Christ as your Lord and Savior? You, you think you're religious like the woman who's in the car st stopped and asked me directions. You may even think you're spiritual, but down deep you don't really know the Lord, but you want to. Brother Jeff will be right there for you to tell him that you would like to know. He can pray with you about that. In fact, I want to ask you just to go ahead and stand right now. Would you just stand and just quietly for a moment bow your head in prayer and ask God while your head's bowed in prayer, Lord, what am I to do about this? Take these moments, please. You may never have them again quite like this. I believe I'm a Christian, but I must, I must say after hearing the message today, I don't know if other people know it. You say, well, why would they want to know it? Well, if they don't see it in you, they should. A husband should see it in his wife, a wife and her husband, if both are saved. A child and a parent should both see it in each other, truly knowing and walking with God, the good shepherd in Christ. So you might want to take an opportunity even while we're praying to recommit your life to being sure, to really being sure that you have a testimony that others hear it and see it in you. Lord, it is our prayer. Many of you are praying that way. Some of you, however, may not know the Lord. Have you ever been to a point in your life where you had the old self, the old person, and you die so that you could be a new person? That's believer's baptism. You may have been sprinkled as a baby, anointed as a baby, but have you been saved? Do you know the Lord personally as your Savior? Have you died with him on the cross in your mind and heart so that you might live with him in the resurrection? Again, I'll be coming down also. You can talk to one of us about that. Father, we pray now you have your way in each life as we recommit our lives to you in Christ's name. Amen.